I'm Amit, uh, the PCB guy. Uh, we're starting a new podcast uh, for all the electrical engineers and PCB designers out there, really focusing on you know how to design and manufacture a better circuit board. And today, uh, for the first ever podcast, we have these amazing guests who have a wealth of knowledge. So we have uh, Steve here. Uh, he's a part of our R&D team and in on our manufacturing process engineering team. Uh, to make fantastic circuit boards and and to make things that really you would think are not possible to to make as well. I'm Steve Carney. Um, I'm the uh, research and development manager at uh, Sierra Circuits. I've been with the company almost 15 years, though my primary background is um, the mechanical side of it, um, drilling, laser, lamination, um, the lithography part of it. And then we also have Dan, who's, you know, just been in the industry forever and has, I would say, made his way into the, you know, signal integrity experts. So we're super excited to have both of you here for our very first podcast. I'm Dan Beaker, and I'm a technical director at NXP Semiconductor. I've been doing this type of work, starting with uh, microcontroller, microprocessor development systems. I started at Motorola in 1980 and worked my way from the uh, tools group into the strategic marketing research group and then moved to the the field as an applications engineer in 1987 and so I went from Phoenix to Detroit and have been supporting automotive uh, customers ever since uh, and this will be my 43rd year at the Motorola Freescale now NXP uh, company it's been a, a wonderful journey uh, I'm ex still excited about what I do every day and it's because of my Great luck in, in becoming associated with Ralph Morrison and with other wonderful experts and, and friends uh, like we have here today in this, uh, this talk. So I'm super excited to have you guys here with us. Uh, we are at the amazing Levi Stadium, and it's very apropos since the Niners are going to the Super Bowl. Also, Design Con is happening across the street. Uh, Dan, why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, Design Con, what you're doing there, and what your class is about. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for letting me be here. This is pretty exciting. Um, yesterday, I got to teach my first workshop for Design Con. I was really excited to be able to do that. And the focus was on a field-based design philosophy as applied to power distribution systems. We had probably 40, 45 people in there, and the response was... This is mind blowing. We never thought of things that way. And uh, then a comment from the uh, the lady in charge of checking all the, the attendees in, she said, I listened to your talk and I could understand what you're talking about. So that's really important to me to be able to convert the the high level physics that people are afraid of into the real rules and the real ideas that they can embrace and use in their everyday jobs. And that was the, the goal that I was given as I uh, studied with Ralph Morrison. And I think that the mission is going very well. And, and I am teaching a class today on high density interconnect design, uh, focusing on the board stack and the vertical transition vias, because that seems to be the part most people are having trouble with. And then I'm also lucky enough to be part of a panel discussing the uh, sensor proliferation as it goes into electric vehicles and the challenges that those pose uh, to both the vehicle uh, range because you're using a whole lot more of the electricity and the the reliability and the software complexity so it's a, a nice approach to the system so. that's amazing yeah let's break some of that down Dan if that's okay so first first things first how does how would you say the electromagnetic field physics plays a role for a PCB designer and how should they understand that and how should it affect their work, their layout? Their design, that's a really good question and that's the one of the foundation issues that have led to the industry accepting failure of EMC as part of the status quo. And we're basically taught that the electricity you know, which is the, really the energy that we use in the circuit boards, is something that travels in, a, in the wire. And that perception has drawn uh, a number of design guidelines that have evolved over time, starting with the older technology, the HMOS, HCMOS 
where making those types of rules and choices for your design philosophy weren't so bad they made it fail. But with today's technology, we have ICs that switch in uh, you know, 60 picoseconds is not an unusually fast switching event. And then you really have to start focusing on the reality. It, the energy we use is electromagnetic field energy. Electromagnetic field energy does not travel in a wire. It travels in the space between conductors, transmission lines. And that goes for everything from DC to blue light. And the philosophy needs to be changed so that when they make choices in the layout that they're building the plumbing, the, the waveguides for the energy to travel in. And that has to start from the very beginning from the board stack into placement of components and into the, the actual routing. And with that approach, it changes the whole landscape. When you use a field-based approach for the, uh, the layout, your chances of success are significantly higher. And that's what I'm trying to help people understand, especially the PCB design guys, because they're the ones that have to put the, the they, they design the copper. And this is what I want to change the focus. You're not designing the copper, you're designing the spaces, the transmission lines. The copper is what you use to set the boundaries to direct the field energy from where it's coming from to where you want it to be. And that's done by making sure that where it has to go, based on the laws of physics, that it will go where you want it to be because you've created that pathway. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's amazing and it debunks some misconceptions about PCB layout. And I think that's, you know, that's a, a great message for any audience that's serious about what they're doing. So that's fantastic. Um, so let's, let's dive in a little bit deeper. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, if I'm a PCB layout person and I have to, you know, pick component placements and, you know, design a stack up, like how would you, given this kind of way of thinking, how can you give some specifics about component placements um, or, you know, what you wouldn't do or stack ups that, you know, that you wouldn't, you know, I would say mis misdesign stack ups that could lead to issues? Well, it starts with being able to accept the, the very basic principles that manage or define the way fields move. move. Um, I found that there are three simple rules that are based on the concept of threes. You know, to be able to contain field, you need two discrete conductors separated by a space. So that's the first triplet. To uh, build a system, you only get three components. You get the conductor, you get the dielectric, and you get a switch. There's really nothing else in the universe. The, uh, the most complicated microprocessor is a giant switch array. And when the switches turn on and off, they don't have current flowing through them in a loop. They take a space that has energy stored in it and connect that space to another, that to another space where there's no energy and the energy then flows into that space. And then the third triplet is that there's only three things you can do with electromagnetic field. You can store it, you can move it, or you can convert it to kinetic energy. This is it. That's the entire electronics industry. Our job is to be able to take those three sets of three rules and use them to manage the way the field moves because we, we are in the business of building products that generate, manage, and consume electromagnetic field energy. So that should be the guiding light. And once the, the, cust the uh, designers take that to heart, then the decisions they make about how they place things are, are focused on the managing of the energy in those spaces. So that drives the board stack. You need to have uh, ground, which is one of the conductors. I call that the continuous conductor, which has to be connected from the source of the energy to the load and not be broken. It has to be a, a continuous piece of of copper. Next to that is a continuous dielectric. That is right next to the continuous conductor. So two of the three elements of, of moving and controlling field are defined. 
And what's left is what I call the switch conductor, which is, starts with the other half of the, the waveguide that's bringing the energy onto the board, so that's the power in, goes to a switch that probably is a voltage regulator, which serves to be able to, to direct the energy from one uh, transmission line or one part of the, the space to a new space, and then that gets distributed across the circuit board. And when you're done, when all the switches are closed, you should be able to see a complete containment of the dielectric on two sides, one by the continuous conductor or what we call ground, and the other is the switch conductor with all the switches sort. So then you've got a pipe that's completely condosed. And that is what drives your board stack so that uh, you want to have a ground plane as your focal point, and then you have signal and power layers, whatever you have on opposite sides of that. So you have two dielectrics that are uh, already defined by having uh, the two elements of containing and moving field, which is two discrete conductors that direct the energy in that dielectric space. So, okay. And then that's what drives the board stack up, and then that drives the, the routing of the signals. Uh, you have to think about you know, when you use a component, that component replaces what would have been just a piece of copper right. so that the field has to enter into that the switch and then back into it. So you're aware of the dielectric, where the energy is at, where it's moving at, and controlling that whole movement of field in those three-dimensional spaces is the key. Okay, wow, that's amazing. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The podcast is for you electrical engineers and PCB designers out there to learn from. And we also have an amazing discussion forum that we recently launched called Sierra Connect. So go there right now, post your questions, and industry experts will respond to your questions. It's an amazing resource that you should take advantage of. So uh, let me ask about some practical like techniques for you know basically using you know, ground and shielding to, you know, help a designer, let's say, be EMC compliant first, first, first time, first time design. Can you give some thoughts around that? Well, it's the, the idea of, of not necessarily having shields, but having first discrete spaces for each signal. Okay. And that's so that there's a place for them to be. I mean, we, we don't have coaxial interconnections on the circuit boards. So we have to make sure that we have at least a two-sided waveguide for the energy to move through. That's the first thing you do. And then one of the rules that I follow is I, I follow a minimum etch approach. So if I paid for copper, I'm not giving it back unless I have to. So I will flood all of the unused spaces with, with ground and then use vias to stitch that ground together. That gives me added uh, robustness, especially to ESD and other, other types of interference because I provide more surface area for these impulses of energy that are, that are going to cause problems and distribute them across uh, a surface that's not used for signal movement. So on the outer layers especially, I want to have copper out there. So when I get a bubble of field on it, that field gets spread out across the, the flood and has a lower impact on the traces because it's all about surface area. The greater the surface area, the happier the field is to be there. And that helps to reduce the impact of this high energy impulse, maybe 15 or 20,000 volts, to, to cause the circuit to either malfunction or even worse is to have the, the system be damaged. So those are kind of the things that I, I would do. Okay, those are, that's then, some crazy. Again, the dielectric awareness, you need to make sure that if you're in the dielectric between layer one and two, and you want to go down in the board stack, that you have to have a pipe to take it down through the board stack. And one of the most common failures I see is people will use a single a signal via and forget that they have to connect the dielectric in the z-axis. And they hope that it gets there. Well, it's like if you have a water faucet in the basement and you turn the water on and you want it to go to the upstairs and you don't have a pipe, well, it gets there eventually, <laughs> but you're not going to like the results. And that's exactly how field behaves. Right. The energy will get there eventually, but you're not going to like it. There's going to be it. problems with signal integrity, problems with radiator susceptibility. All those kind of things happen when you just don't follow the simple rule to discrete component, co conductors separated by a space. Okay. Well, that's great. It's, that's it's, good it's practical It's all about advice. the space. Uh, <laughs> yes. And uh, <laughs> didn't your daughter compose a song about well, that? Well, she's my uh, performing artist. So she oh. plays the guitar and sings. And uh, about 
this was, I think, the first year that I was actually going to present at PCB West, uh, so 2015, and I wanted to have a hook to, to get people to have uh, some different perspective, because I it took me almost 10 years before Ralph Morrison finally broke through my brain and had me stop thinking about circuit theory and, and wires and current loops and return currents. And I said, I need to find a way so these people don't take 10 years to, to absorb this. I want them to be able to be brainwashed into into getting it in the one or two hours that I have their their focus for. So I heard my children were listening to Megan Trainers all about that base. Uh, and I'm like, you know, base and space rhyme. I think I'm going to take a, a stab at trying to write words that will uh, apply to my classes. And so I sat in my office with my headphones and listened to that song over and over again and writing my It's All About the Space song. And the focus is trying to get people to think about the idea that the energy moves in spaces and it's not the wires. And, and that it came out to be pretty cool. Uh, I was going to have both my daughters sing it, but there was never a chance when they were coordinated at the <laughs> same time. And the week before I had to leave for PCB West that year, I, I said, I need the song. You've got to go take care of it. So my daughter went upstairs and uh, with her iPhone and played my song for me. And it's the rest is history. I use it every every time I uh, present and uh it's been pretty well received, you know. <laughs> the goal is that people wake up in the middle of the night screaming, "It's all about the space," you know? <laughs> and, and that then I've I've achieved my goal. You know? That's great. No, that's that's wonderful. That's very endearing as well. Uh, so you know, I think uh, you've done a, you've done a great job of setting like the foundation, and um, it seems like you know Ralph Morrison played a big role as your mentor. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and just you know? How how Ralph Morrison, you know, changed your perspective on field wave, you know, physics of electronics. It was it was life changing to say the least. The way I met Ralph was a series of very fortunate accidents, hmm. and uh, there were some events that led to me being asked to put together a panel of experts for one of the company conferences for customers. And like any good pretend EMC guy, I had a really nice library of books. So I had I had books from Howard Johnson, from uh, I had books from Dr. Archambault, I had uh, Lee Ritchie stuff, I had uh, uh, Henry Ott, uh, the Keenan books, and so I started calling the authors because I was I I committed to making this this happen, and all of them were going to a conference in in. Uh, the UK. There was an international EMC consortium happening. And I, like everybody else, I you have to have Ralph Morrison's grounding and shielding book. That was the one you, you had to see. So I had this beautiful set of books that I rarely looked at. And uh, I called and left a message for Ralph. And he called me back and says, who are you and why are you calling? And I'm like, well, I'm Dan Beaker and from Freescale. And we're having a, a, I'm having a panel of experts and I'd like you to be part of it. And he agreed. And so we started talking about it. And I found out he was a physicist. I'm like, oh, this is great. You can be my first speaker because you can establish the, the basis for the for the talk. You'll talk about EM physics. And so we had the, I had several experts there. And I'm not going to name names at this moment, but Ralph was first. And the rest of them started doing their talk. And by the time they got done, he was so mad he could hardly stand still. He was bouncing up and down going, they've got it wrong. They've got it wrong. That's not how it works. I don't know. So Ralph, and he was probably his mid 80s by then already and he because I dragged him out of retirement and he's bouncing up and down I said Ralph we got, you got to calm down let's go have lunch and you can tell me about it and he started tying his first lecture to me on on physics and fields and I'm like this really makes sense because everything else was was uh, confusing especially going to different single integrity classes there was always contradiction in what they were speaking about and looking backwards it was None of that was malicious as they were talking about what worked for them, their experience. But it wasn't always based on the science. And so right. I hired Ralph to come and teach classes for me. And we became friends. And he decided he was going to make me his apprentice. And he was going to teach me field physics or kill me trying. <laughs> and uh, we spent uh, as much time as we possibly could. Whenever That's I great. would come to PCB West, I would spend a few days with Ralph. And a few times I actually got to fly out here and, and stay at his house. And we would go up into his little guest house and with a whiteboard. And he's telling me all the, 
the realities of physics, and then I would make my comments back, and he'd, you know, it was almost the the ruler on the on the knuckles when I'd say the wrong thing because he was very keen on language and making sure that I used the proper words, and he explained in great detail why what I said was wrong, and and we we went through that relationship, and then I I was still going to PCB West and other signal integrity conferences just to try to get some knowledge and having classes with some of the other people that were known in the industry and, and trying to decipher what was real. And uh, I finally got to the point where I felt comfortable with making with teaching it. And uh, one one of the sessions I did was in Austin for the, uh, the company's applications and design community. And Ralph was in the audience because I was there trying to get him to help convince us that fields were real and EM physics was important. And and he walked up to the to me after the after I did my my presentation, and I knew I was in trouble. I thought you know, <laughs> I'd said something wrong. And he looked up and says, "Dan, I think you finally got it." So that's one of the most the most important and exciting achievements of my career. But that's taking amazing. his knowledge and using it in my everyday designs and working with customers to, to help them understand the, the physics and how the behavior is important and how using you know your product, the PC board structure, to direct the energy, uh, I can work on anything now. You know, it changed my whole perspective. I'm not afraid of, you know, electric vehicle inverter designs, high high speed network controllers, all that the rules are the same. All that changes is the geometry. So the only math I need is algebra. And the structures are predefined and it's very simple. I and mean, once you stop being confused and scared by the, the hairy math, the, the calculus that everybody presents in the school and start looking at things from the very simple behaviors that are really driven by you know, physical structures. And that part was probably the most difficult for me to, as a digital engineer, I mean, I worked on 6820 stuff, I thought I was Superman, <laughs> and uh, I didn't care about geometries or fields. But once I understood that it was energy, it did travel in it in the dielectric, and that it was all about you know creating the spaces that would direct the energy to what it was. So that's great. That changed everything. That's great. No, that's very endearing. It's fantastic. It's always good to have a mentor like that. That's amazing. Just. Uh, do you have an example of how the energy misbehavior in a board caused the board not to function well? Or do you have any kind of thoughts or examples on that? If not, that's fine, but I thought I might as well ask. And see. Well, every, every time there's an EMC failure, there's, you know, it's because they failed to control the, the electromagnetic energy properly. And one of the most common ones have to do with power supply designs. Almost all of the radiant emissions issues that I've worked on are because of there is a, a, an improper understanding of, of delivery of energy to the ICs. And we were taught in the, in the, before that if you have any type of radiant emissions problems, it's the output, the switching event that causes the problem. And what I've discovered is it's not the switching event, it's the, the opposite event. This is when you turn on a switch and the energy moves into that pipe, there's never a, uh, continuous impedance. So it's like you have two different size hoses and you have a big hose and a little hose. When the big hose turns on, the, the little hose drops pressure and that's the reduction of voltage. So you get a, a drop in voltage that's the same frequency, same edge as the output. So if it's a nanosecond switch, you get a nanosecond, I call a depletion wave, going upstream looking for the uh, source of energy and if you don't have the right amount of energy at the right place on the board then this nanosecond event is can find a quarter wavelength and find its way to then radiate and most commonly is they will not have followed the one dielectric rule because they don't think power is important clocks are important that they will separate power from ground and that causes a discontinuity that will allow sometimes the energy to the depletion energy that wave because it's creating a magnetic field too. And that magnetic field that's relative to the changing voltage is what causes a changing voltage that then finds its way into space. And that happens everywhere. Well, I mean, that hundreds was, of designs that way. That was a great explanation. And I hope people, you know, really kind of digest that and understand that. 
Sierra Circuits has been working very hard for electrical engineers and PCB designers like yourself on our engineering tools. These are engineering tools to help you design faster. We want to reduce your design time and get the design right the first time. So our top tools on our website, number one is the PCB Stackup Planner. Uh, knowing that you have a good stack up right away uh, for your design. Number two is the bomb checker. It will do basic scrubbing, make sure your ref deses are good, your MPNs are good, the MPN matches the description. You know, all these are amazing features of the bomb checker. Uh, we also have an impedance tool, uh, which is based on Maxwell's equations. Uh, and it, these are all for free for the PCB designer and electrical engineer. You know, please go check them out. It's all for you. So as, as you mentioned, Sierra Circuits is a PCB manufacturer. We have one of our PCB manufacturing experts here. Uh, he's been working on kind of a new uh, way of building circuit boards. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, we've been working on what is now referred to as ultra high density, which is defined as sub uh, two mil line in space and below. So where most people have taken the approach where they're putting the traces on the surface and trying to make the fine circuitry that way, um, we go the opposite direction. We actually trench into the dielectric and then fill plate to form the traces. So that has two major advantages. Um, first of all, when you um, put, say, a one mil line on the surface and you want a equivalent to a half ounce copper, you've essentially got a, almost a square feature. So when you go to laminate it and you put pressure on it and squeeze the resin between the traces, it puts a lot of pressure and those features move around. We found that out the hard way. So if you embed the traces into the laminate, um, you don't have any registration issues. Everything stays exactly where it needs to be. Um, the other big advantage is, um, you know, when you look at, at even the semi-additive processes where they're going with super thin base coppers, you still have to etch it. So when you have a, say, a one mil line and you have that edge exposed, you're still going to get some etching. You're going to get some little mouse bites and you're going to get some degradation. It, it's going to, you're going to lose consistency of that trace line. So by essentially forming a trench and putting the copper in that, then we, we, we're protecting the, the side of the trace from, from any etchant. So we get a, a super consistent trace width all the way through however long we have to go. Um, so those are the two big advantages. Um, another thing that, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of things that we can do with it that we're just now starting to look at. Um, you don't really need you don't really need termination pads um, through holes, things like that. Essentially, what we can do with it is that if you can cross one trace, and rather than drill a hole, you can just trench down to that next layer and connect that way. So you don't need the all the holes and all the vias and all the landing pads and all of that. So um, that's essentially it so sounds exciting yeah Indeed. yeah so we're getting down um i don't know if you can see this um this is an example of a one mil line mil and a half space um we're getting into some super high density um materials um yeah, i'll show it for the audience yeah <laughs> super high density <laughs> so anyway um yeah that's it um just real brief. What do you think how that's going to kind of impact and, you know, design in general and, and the physics of, you know, the electromagnetic fields that we've been talking about? I, I think it's pretty exciting. I w was privileged to be part of the uh, original announces, announcement of this product. And there are a lot of opportunities to do things in the laminate layer. Um, so you don't waste that that space. I my first thought when I heard about this was, you've got a, a one mil wide conductor that's three mils deep, and they can place them two mils apart. And if you run an impedance calculator on that, you've got a forty-seven ohm trace 
in free space. So you can have a single layer uh, controlled impedance transmission line, and you can repeat that horribly. You can do you know a signal, a ground, and a signal, and put two traces with 47 ohms in a space of about seven mils. And, and that's pretty exciting. And especially with the challenges of the new ICs, we're going to 0 0.4, 0 0.2, you know, 0.3 pitch components. How do you connect to those things? You know, people use HDI or ultra HDI, but that's really difficult to, to implement. And I think that being able to do this type of routing, especially when you can punch a hole and drop some copper from, from one layer to the other, that without having to have a via and then make these types of connections. And there are other things I'm look, I'm thinking about is because I'm, I'm getting all kinds of ideas after hearing what he, what uh, Mike just said is that they, uh, I think if you look at this, I think this is a way one of reducing the impact of the weave. So the idea of, of having different signals travel at different uh, effective propagation times, which is a real issue for some of the very high speed buses that I, you know, I've taken a number of classes where you're looking at how do you overcome the impact of the varying uh, dielectric properties as you go from the resin to the glass to the resin to the glass and from, from trace to trace, that, that variation can cause significant issues with, with meeting the timing requirements. I think that being able to do this, you reduce the, the impact of that type of, of issue. And I think this is kind of a way to extend the upper bandwidth of the traditional uh, FR4 material and without having to go to some of the more exotic materials. I think yeah, that there's uh, some great yeah. potential for that and it keeps you, makes you be able to develop a very high performance product and keep the cost down. Yes. And, and, and I think from what I've been told is this uh, process is reasonably cost competitive to traditional uh, etch or you know re removal technologies uh, certainly uh, in order of the cost of a, of a blind or varied via type approach that you can probably get higher densities with similar cost to a, a traditional board and again I think there are advantages not just for the smaller traces but being able to uh, to increase the, the transmission speeds and Mike was talking about earlier about how they were looking at ways to to reduce the the travel time because we have issues with trying to get signals from place to place and one of the issues with high speed signals is that they need to have a specifically controlled impedance very quickly after they re leave the driver and then there is a limit to how far apart things can be before you have to start managing that impedance with the faster transition times then it basically extends the length that you can put things, the, the separation before you have to care about controlled impedance. And the result from that will be that maybe there are a number of signals where we don't even won't care about that impedance because we are placing the two drivers now within a lump distance because the lump distance has gone from maybe a, an inch or two inches, but because we have a signal that travels faster so it goes farther during that rise time, which is when the signal's turning on, that we can maybe get three or four inches, and that is going to be a big deal, I think. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is um, we're doing a fully additive um, metallization in the in the trench, so we no longer have the dendrite structure of the copper foil to deal with. Because if you look at the semi-additive processes, even if you're putting a three micron foil on the surface, you still have the dendrite structure to get it to stick to the laminate. So we don't have to worry, by embedding them, we don't have to worry about um, peel strength much anymore because it's not going to move once it's in there. So we don't have the dendrite structure and that seems, yeah, you, so it's, we've solved some of the problems that, that, have, are, that are compounding with ultra high density so, um, you know, they want to bump the signal speed up, but then they're going to um, super flat copper foils, low dendrite structures. And then that, um, that magnifies the problem of getting all these little traces to stick in the same spot. Yeah. And then it reduces losses because there's less interaction between the field and the, and the surface of the copper. 
with it being smoother so you have a, a nicer surface area so you have less of that energy converted into heat that you know one of the three things you do with field is to convert it into kinetic energy and it interacts with every molecule it comes in contact with it. Um, copper or the dielectric and by making it smoother then you have the, it makes the field happier as it's greens down through at the speed of light it's less bumpy <laughs> so that's pretty exciting I, I can't wait to play with that technology no I think it is very exciting and uh, there's it's very I, I think of it as cross-functional right that we're changing the way manufacturing is happening but that's absolutely going to change the way that an electrical engineer needs to think about their circuit as well so lots to think about here so Dan uh, I, I understand that you know you recently had a circuit board manufactured by Sierra Circuits, which thank you very much. But would you like to talk a little bit about that, that circuit board and the yeah, experience? Yeah, I, I would love to. I was challenged with doing a uh, basically an Ethernet gathering board uh, designed to work with radar sensors in automotive. And that was dubbed the, the Purple Box, and it was actually demoed at CES this year. And the challenges were uh, very... Uh, small form factor and uh, very uh, large component density and, and the other thing was it needed to be done in a hurry the, the, especially the first pass because we needed to get prototypes built so they could start doing the software because the software integration for a for a, a, an ethernet control network is is pretty challenging and so I knew there was only one solution as I, I talked to Amit and said, I've got this board and you know, can you fabricate it? And oh, by the way, can you assemble it? Because I don't think any of my traditional CMs are going to be able to handle this type of uh, component density. And so we, we started that project and we were able to get them to, to fabricate and assemble uh, a number of these units. It, what, 15 days, I think, was the cycle time. From start yeah. to finish. From start to finish, and yeah. All the boards worked. Uh, I used my my philosophy to the design. It was functional first first thing out of the out of the uh, box, and we were su successfully demoed it. And it was so successful at the at CES that now I've been told by marketing I need to go build. We're building twenty seven boards for me right now as fast as they possibly can because we have great demand for this particular application and again sir for autonomous vehicle so very cutting edge stuff it's uh we had challenges to use all of my techniques but more importantly as this board is intended to be a full reference design so automotive uh, components and automotive design rules and then uh, my the plan will be to do full uh, uh, certification from an EMC perspective and, and do over temperature and the whole, the whole by nine yards so that a, a customer can clone the design. You know, I want them to be able to, to look at this and do the right thing. And I, I think we did a lot of very uh, unique uh, approaches to the way we built the board. And I, I'm very excited about, you know, building more of them with, with Sierra. So. All right. Awesome. And, I, I always plan and promise them up front that I'm going to make them crazy. And, <laughs> and I definitely do that. I always push my suppliers past the envelope, and we develop new new avenues together, and that's pretty exciting as well. And that's been something I've done with Sierra a couple of times. If you haven't heard of Sierra Circuits, Sierra Circuits is a PCB manufacturer and assembler all in one, located in the Bay Area, uh, right around all the innovation that's happening. And Sierra Circuits is capable of building everything from start to finish, uh, from simple standard product to uber complex, HDIs, flexes, rigid flex, high speed applications, you know, anything that you can think of, we pretty much can build. Uh, and we do it quick. Uh, so if you need to maintain your schedule and be on time, Sierra Circuits is your vendor of choice. Thank you so much. And so that board had a blind via. Do you want to just take the audience through the basics of, you know, what it takes to do a blind via? So um, this particular board um, actually had three separate drill files in it. So it had a, um, a fill via program, and then it had a final through hole, and then it had a laser via. Um, so the laser via is... Um, 
those are relatively simple these days. Um, really what um, we've been at this type of work for almost 12 years now. So um, one of the things that to make all this happen, um, we have a, have a um, control system. So we put your stack up into this software program. And then what happens from there is that program talks to the um, our material movement program. So one of the things that, that when you get into microelectronics, you have to control all your material movement. Everything is constantly moving. So anytime it goes into a press, it, it moves. So if you have, say, a, a 12 by 18 panel, you put it in the press, it's going to shrink 20 mils in the in the. 12 axis and almost 30 mils in the 18. So if you are got a 5 mil laser VN, you're trying to land on a 9 mil pad, and you've got a 30 mil shrinkage, then you've got to be able to, to measure that and control it and know where you're going to end up. So um, what happens is that the first program takes the stack up, it outputs the data to the exact system, which is all the material movement, it um, puts it um, into our CAM software, which starts to design all the design rules for it. Um, and then it also puts that stack up into our um, program that controls all the, all the drilling. So what that does is it looks at, at the stack up and the copper weight and the material type, and it automatically defines feeds and speeds. Um, another thing is it writes the whole targeting structure that's another thing that that if you look at the way the board goes through the shop, you have all the upfront stuff, all the programming and, and all the targeting structure and all of this stuff. Then you have to be able to track that. So what happens is um, we start with the exact and the exact tells the exposure unit what to do. And then the exposure unit puts all the targets in. Then it goes to drilling. Then we pick up and acquire all those targets with the x-ray drill. And then we put targets in for that. And then for mechanical drilling, we're all vision drilling. So we don't have the old, and the old style was you started with a, with a zero point and then you went out from there. What these machines do is they disconnect all that. So they go out and they look at the at a set of targets that we put in with the, with the direct imager. And then it, it calculates the scale and all of that off of that. And then it drills the pattern. So it's almost free forming. It, it goes so out. So it compensates for all of the changes in the geometry exactly. of the board as it goes through the process. Right. So, because when you go through sequential laminations, what happens is that each time you go through it, it shrinks more and more and more. So when you get um, another thing that's happening, like with your board, you had a. Um, you had what we refer to as a as a SF file where we had a non-conductive field vias for for VN pad type stuff. So what happens there is that gets drilled, and then it goes down the street, and we have to plate it, fill it, planarize it, and that in turn moves everything around. So when it comes back, it's not the same panel size as when it went out. So then we have to reacquire that. So then when we get into sequential lamination, we have all the machines talking to each other. So what happens is, like in the laser, say you wanted to add another layer to that. Um, so when we do the laser, the laser has the capability. Laser is probably one of the smartest machines we have. So that'll go out and look at the alignment targets and calculate the scale. It'll drill the holes, and while it's doing that, it will drill another set of targets that the direct imager looks at. So the whole thing repeats itself. So if you're getting into stack views and things like that, we're, we're constantly dealing with material movement. We're constantly dealing with, with ways to reacquire that movement and find out exactly where it's, where it's doing. So another thing, too, is um, controlling the movement, material movement. So we have a self-learning system. So when we look at your stack up, the system automatically puts out predicted scale values for the for the inner layers. And these are based on material type, copper weights, how much copper you're going to have, because like a, a plane layer will move differently than a signal layer. So it calculates all this stuff. 
And then that image is output to the LDI, and then that in turn prints targets that when we get back to the, to the X-ray drill, we go through and we measure each one of those layer, and we can calculate what the movement does, and then it's self-learning. So whatever we, we output a file with a prediction, comes back through, we look at it at the X-ray drill, and then it's constantly updating. So right now we have roughly 200,000 data points in our exact software because it's looking at all kinds of stuff and it and it then it tells you what it likes and what it doesn't like. Um, it actually spits out a layer map for drilling. So if you do have a shift, um, we can actually scale to a signal layer. Um, so we can go through and we can isolate what the what the tightest layer is and we can scale to that. Um, when we're dealing with sub-assemblies, we can if we have three or four sub-assemblies, we can measure all of them and then lay them out on the table and calculate the scaling so we, we get a best fit for that whole set of, of, wow. of sub-assemblies. It's got to have a huge impact on not just the yield, but the reliability of the yes. product as well. So right. that's pretty exciting. Yeah, we know exactly what we're dealing with and we don't, you know, because we're all quick turn, so we have to do this all up front. Um, and, it, and it's... It's something that you have to build. So we've been working on this for like the last 12 years. So what happens is that this stuff is so, um, it's so process intensive. So how we run our presses, how we store our material, how we do all this stuff is unique to us. So if someone was to take our database for scaling, it wouldn't do them any good. So this is something that, that's evolved and then We've gotten into a lot of strange stuff over the years, so um, a lot of mixed materials, things like that. So we have rules in our um, in our drilling control software. So it'll look at certain materials. Um, we get a lot of, of mixed materials these days. So you'll have a you have a piece of Rogers and surrounded by a bunch of FR4 and they'll stick all kinds of stuff in there now. So this is actually smart enough. It goes, okay, this material is the most difficult to drill. So it'll grab that information and it'll set up the machine to drill that specific material. So it's, it, we just need a whole lot of, of continuity and consistency <clears throat> out of everything. So. That's why they worked the first time. Yeah, they, that's all why of they worked the first all time. All of the boards worked. So. Yeah, and that's why we can build it as fast as we can because all this stuff is scripted, and yeah. we're really lucky. We got a really smart automation guy. Yeah. Because um, another thing, when when you look at the alignment targets, again, we found out this the hard way. Um, you know, years of trial and error. So if you if you're trying to measure movement. Um, for a specific core. So like I say, if you've got a plane area, um, it's not going to move much where a signal layer will move a lot. So what has to happen to track that, because um, originally we put all the, all those targeting, that targeting structure on the outside of the board. So all of that's moving exactly how we thought it was going to. But then you got this big chunk of copper in the center of it and that didn't move at all. So this, uh, we were able to automate it. So depending on what that layer looks like, we'll actually move those targets inboard and we'll measure the movement of the part and we'll forget about the outside of it. How does that, uh, the fact that, you know, one of my process requirements is I leave all the copper, I ground flood everything. Does that help improve the behavior of the, the so-called signal layers because there's more yeah, surface, yes. more copper in there. Right, so. Yeah, so the more copper you have, the more the more stability you have. Okay, so that, again, I, I'm telling everybody again when I preach this, is it it helps improve the yields, not just from the fact you use, if in the etch process, you keep the fidelity of the etch higher because you consume less of the chemicals, but in this case, it helps improve the fidelity of the drills because things don't move around as much right, during yes. the lamination process. It so makes it more stable. Don't get rid of the copper. Keep your <laughs> copper. Be stingy. Yeah, yeah, I know. I agree. Yeah, I mean, there's no use sending it down the drain, essentially.
Yeah. So I mean, we we recycle it, but you know, it's it it's better. Yeah, yeah, more it, copper. It's better. better to leave it on. Yeah. So it also helps when it comes to it comes to lamination because you've got more to the the resin will stick to the to the copper better than it will to the to the laminate to laminate. Yeah, sometimes I when I'm walking the floor, I see fun, funky designs where it's like a single trace going <laughs> the length of a board. I'm like, oh dear. That gets to be interesting. Yeah. Well, you probably know this better than I do, but it, electricity is essentially lazy. So if you um, if you put little tiny features inside of a plane area, then you know you start to plate it because you're asking the the power to go underneath the resist and come up and then go back underneath and come up again and come up again and come up again and it finds that first way out and then initializes in the plating bat and goes okay i'm done i'm not going to go any further so um but anyway we're addressing that whole set of problems now too with so there's a lot of um it's pretty pretty cool right now there's a lot of um the way we're building going to be building boards is is definitely going to change in the next couple of years nice well i hope to have you back and we can talk about that and you know i think this was it's always amazes me how cross-functional this industry is right from physics to to layout to you know manufacturing it all kind of plays on each other there's a lot of science involved there's a lot going on in the circuit board yeah so i definitely appreciate uh you guys taking the time to you know meet with us meet with the audience and share your wisdoms so that's always great thank you just remember it's all about the space <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one thanks for tuning in to sierra circuits podcast uh, we very much appreciate taking the time and the goal is for you to learn a few things every time uh, from the industry experts we have on so stay tuned for future experts that we have for you.